Today, we're going to explore the latest updates and changes in the Kubernetes platform, specifically in the newly released version 1.27. This update is packed with new features, API changes, improved documentation, cleanups, bug fixes, and deprecations. My name is Mumshad Manambeth, and welcome to this video. Kubernetes releases follow a semantic versioning terminology, where the releases are in the form x.y.z, where x is a major version, y is a minor version, and z is the past version. Kubernetes releases happen approximately three times every year. Each release has a four-month life cycle. We have an upcoming video where we deep dive into Kubernetes release cycles, so be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified when that video is out. Now, Kubernetes has a tradition of selecting a release theme for each major release, which reflects the significant shifts and community efforts towards the Kubernetes project. The theme for the version 1.25 released in August 2022 was named Combiner. The theme reflected upon the many, many individual components that when combined, take the form of the project that you see today. The theme electrifying for Kubernetes 1.26 is about recognizing the importance of the diverse computing resources used to develop and deploy Kubernetes, while also raising awareness about the need to consider energy consumption and environmental sustainability. The release is dedicated to the coordinated efforts of volunteers who made it possible and emphasizes the importance of individual contributions to the release process. The theme for the latest release is Chill Vibes, which symbolizes the calmness of the 1.27 release. The theme is inspired by the effective management of the release by the Kubernetes community. This release is the first release of 2023 and includes 60 enhancements. Typically, Kubernetes employs a multi-stage feature release process where each enhancement goes through the alpha stage, then beta, GA, and then stable phases. If you're interested in learning more about how an enhancement request goes through Kubernetes, check out our video on Kubernetes enhancement proposals that we posted before. Notably, the 1.27 release saw nine enhancements promoted to the stable stage, marking them as production ready. Now let's take a high level look at the changes in the Kubernetes 1.27 release. Each release comes with enhancements that can be categorized as features, API changes, documentation, deprecation, and bugs and regression. As such, we have a big list of enhancements in the 1.27 release as listed in the release notes, as you can see here. But in this video, we're gonna go over a few of the most important ones only. So number one in the list, the k8.gcr.io image registry has been frozen. Now, as you may be aware, Kubernetes relied on a custom GCR Google container registry domain called k8.gcr.io for hosting its container images, including the official Kubernetes images, as well as various Kubernetes add-ons and tools. Now, while this arrangement has served the project well, there are other cloud providers and vendors who would like to offer hosting services for Kubernetes images. Consequently, Google had generously committed to renew its donation of $3 million to support the infrastructure of the project, and Amazon has announced a matching donation during the KubeCon NA 2022 keynote in Detroit. The introduction of additional hosting providers will bring several benefits, including faster downloads for users, since the servers will be closer to them, and reduced egress bandwidth and costs for GCR. To facilitate this expansion, the images are moved from k8.gcr.io to registry.kh.io, which will distribute the load evenly between Google and Amazon and other providers, with more providers that are gonna come in, in the future. So one significant update in the recent past is that the kh.gcr.io, the older one, is frozen as of April 3rd, and it has been replaced with the new registry, which is registry.kh.io, which is now controlled by the community. Now, it is important to note that the previous kh.dcr.io registry is no longer functional and no future Kubernetes related images or subprojects will be uploaded there. So it is recommended that you go and update the Helm charts and manifest files that use the old kh.dcr.io and replace it with the newer registry. For more information on this topic, please visit the URL that's given in the description below. The next one in our list is that the seccom default graduates to stable. So container security is a crucial aspect of any Kubernetes deployment. Without proper security measures in place, containers can be vulnerable to attacks that can compromise the entire cluster. So seccom, short for secure computing mode, is a Linux kernel feature that restricts the system calls that a process can make. 
In Kubernetes, SecComp can be used to enhance the security of containers by limiting their ability to perform certain privileged operations. So SecComp profiles defines a set of rules that specify which system calls a container is allowed to make, effectively reducing the attack surface of the container by limiting the available kernel interfaces. So Kubernetes allows you to use custom SecCom profiles to restrict the system calls that containers can make or to use a default SecCom profile provided by your container runtime to provide a secure baseline configuration. However, this is disabled by default or this was disabled by default. If we enable SecCom by default, we make Kubernetes more secure implicitly. And this release of Kubernetes has the option to specify a default SecCom profile that will be used for all containers. To use this feature, simply run the kubelet with the SecCom default command line flag enabled for each node where you want to use it. And when enabled, the kubelet will use the runtime SecCom profile by default, which is defined by the container runtime. So this is an improvement from the previous default mode of unconfined where SecCom was disabled, which posed a significant security risk. So it is important to note that the default profiles may vary between container runtimes and their release version. It's recommended that you review your container runtimes documentation for specific details on their default SecCom profiles. And overall, the update provides Kubernetes users with a safer and more secure default configuration for their workloads. Moving forward, the next major feature is that there's a new API available for accessing logs from the nodes. Now, a node, as you all know, is a control plane or worker machine that's part of the Kubernetes cluster. A node log refers to the log data generated by a particular node in a cluster. The logs generated by a node can be helpful for debugging issues that arise in services running on that node. Now, keeping that in mind, when services running on a node within a cluster encounter issues, Cluster administrators may find it challenging to identify the problem. Typically, they need to SSH or RDP into the node to examine the service logs and diagnose the issue. And the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal 2258 proposed a feature to allow viewing node logs via the API. With the 1.27 release, the node log query feature simplifies this process by enabling the administrator to access logs using kube control. This is particularly helpful when working with Windows nodes as the problems like CNI misconfigurations and other hard to detect issues can prevent containers from starting up, even though the node is ready. And by utilizing this feature, administrators can easily investigate and solve such problems. So what's the underlying mechanism that makes it function? You know that the node proxy endpoint already has a var log viewer available through the kubelet. With the new feature, a shim is added that leverages the journal cuddle on Linux nodes and the get win event commandlet on Windows nodes to supplement this endpoint. The command's existing filters are used to facilitate log filtering and additionally, the kubelet applies heuristics to obtain logs by first checking the native operating system logger. And if that is not available, the logs are retrieved from the following locations that are listed here. So how do we use this feature? To utilize the node log query feature, it's important to enable the node log query feature gate for the relevant node and ensure that both the enable system log handler and the enable system log query options are set to true in the kubelet configuration. Now, once these prerequisites are met, you can retrieve logs from your nodes. For instance, you can retrieve the kubelet service logs from a node using the following example command. Run the kube control get command with the raw flag and specify the API as slash API slash v1 slash nodes followed by the node name slash proxy slash logs and then you have the query and you query for the service. So follow the documentation that's given here for all the available options for querying node logs. Here's the next major update. Mutable scheduling directives for jobs graduates to GA. Now in Kubernetes, a parallel job refers to a type of workload that allows multiple pods to be run concurrently to complete a job. Parallel jobs are used for computationally intensive tasks or batch processing where the workload can be split into smaller pieces that can be executed in parallel to reduce processing time. Now, when running parallel jobs in Kubernetes, it is often necessary to have specific constraints for the pods, such as running all the pods in the same availability zone or ensuring they only run on certain types of hardware, like GPU model X or Y, but not mix of both. So to achieve this, Kubernetes uses a suspend field that allows custom queue controllers to decide when a job should start. Now, when a job is suspended, it remains idle until the custom queue controller decides to unsuspend it based on various scheduling factors. However, once a job is unsuspended, the actual placement of jobs is handled by the Kubernetes scheduler 
and the custom queue controller has no influence on where the pods will land. Now this is where the new feature of mutable scheduling directives for jobs come into play. So here's what happens. This feature lets you update a job's scheduling directives before it starts. This means custom queue controllers can influence the pod placement without having to handle the actual pod to node assignment themselves. To learn more about this feature, check out the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal 2926, allow updating scheduling directives for jobs. It got all the juicy details. Now the final one in our list is a single pod access mode for persistent volumes that graduates to beta. So persistent volumes have several access modes available as you probably already know, such as read-only many where the volume can be mounted as read-only by many nodes, and read write many where the volume can be mounted as read write by many nodes and read write once is where the volume can be mounted as read write by a single node however it can allow multiple pods to access the volume when the pods are running on the same node and a new mode named read write once pod feature was introduced in kubernetes version 1.22 it limits volume access to only one pod in the cluster. And this approach ensures that only a single pod can write to the volume at a time, making it particularly helpful for stateful applications that require exclusive access to a storage. Now you can read more about this feature in the link that's given below. And this feature has now been graduated to beta. So how do we use this feature? Kubernetes 1.27 and later will have read write once pod beta feature enabled by default. However, it is worth noting that this feature is exclusively supported for CSI volumes only. To enable this feature, simply add the read write once pod mode to the access modes while creating the PVC. For more information on the read write once pod access mode, you can refer to the Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal 2485. Well, that's all for this video. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for the latest updates on Kubernetes. Until next time, goodbye.